Play me some Pippin, man. Trippy, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's up, mother cousin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the Homesick Lone Wolf Podcast. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. Yo, this is episode 11. Baby. Baby. What's happening, mother cousins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the Homesick Lone Wolf Podcast with your host, John Schaefer. We're making it happen. We're out here. We're doing things. I hope you feel good today. Play me some Pippin, man. This is just kind of trying to fill in some gaps here because we just told the story of the most traumatic time of my life, the most life-changing month of my life, and the events that really destroyed who I used to be. These are the events that made me evolve. These events blasted me into millions of fragments. And I think to this day, I'm still still healing and still kind of picking some things up. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm thankful to be alive. It was a rough, rough time in my life. So if you got to check out the PTSD TBI story, my, my month of just pure hell and trauma the story of my concussion and literally having all of my choices and behavior, my attitude, everything led to the to this month and these points and these this downfall and this point in time where I had to really look at myself and look at my behavior and ask myself who I am and what what is important to me, what I stand for, what do I believe in. It was just kind of being a selfish person and It's just what happens when you can be self-obsessed and just kind of me, 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 just always focusing on yourself all the time and not being able to grow or get any constructive criticism or healthy advice or healthy criticism from anybody. But if you haven't seen the last episode, I recommend you check it out because some of this isn't going to make sense unless you've checked it out. But basically to run down the last episode, I was working at Steamworks. I was in Durango, Colorado. And I was just kind of being a selfish partier and pretty destructive and no goals, not really building towards anything. I was learning everything on this menu at Steamworks. I was learning how to do every station. I was starting to hit a ceiling there at Steamworks with just all the partying after work and the bitterness, just kind of fighting with authority figures there and just kind of standing up for the kitchen and being a voice for the kitchen and it got a little hectic and stressful and destroyed some pretty important relationships to me a lot of my bosses and things like that i just let a lot of people down at steamworks at this particular time this is in 2012 this is in 2012 let's check it out i'm living with jake kramer at this time and i went to community of learners a charter school in durango with jake kramer long time ago so Boom, it was cool to meet up again as adults, quote, adults, at Steamworks working there. And it was good. He was in a different dimension than I was. I was definitely focused on trying to become a better person, trying to save money and build, and trying to just be be a little bit better of a person after being so destructive and homeless and no plan and not not being productive at all for so long. I was just partying, so all of a sudden I was around a lot of bad people, a lot of toxic people, and your vibe attracts your tribe. And in this time, 2012, I was just partying, man. I was just drinking and slaying it at work. That's what it was all about, was going to Steamworks, clocking in, putting on the apron, and just kicking some major ass with the homies there at work. And then I started started dating this girl at work, and it became this crazy thing, and I lost focus, and I think I was just trying to protect her or make sure people were respecting her and things like that. It got to where I was just working tons. I was working tons, and it was just this place that I could be and exist, be productive, and make myself useful. But yeah, I got sidetracked, man, and I was just, I was making some money, and I wasn't doing anything very mature or productive with it. I think I was just taking all the friends out, buying tons of booze and alcohol and partying, and buy food and whatever, buy weed, and it just went really fast. I wasn't making good choices at all. It was this live fast, destructive mentality. Like, I don't know the exact year that Jake died, but Jake Kramer passed away 
So while I'm living with him, there's like empty beer bottles all over the place. There's empty oxycodone pill bottle from the hospital there. Just kind of trying to figure things out. Yeah, he called into work one night. I had to work for him. He had this cut or something on his arm. And he told all of us in the kitchen it was some kind of a, a wire. He was building a fence and a wire snapped and cut his arm. We all kind of found out later it was because of a heroin addiction he was battling and somehow got a little infection there on his vein. Ooh, disgusting. But yeah, anyways, you can hide that shit. You can hide that shit from the naive people, but you can't really fool everybody. Anyways, Jake Kramer, I don't know the exact time, but he passed away. I think he like quit heroin for a while. I believe he quit heroin for a little while, and I think he was doing this Jesus thing. I'm not sure. I think he was all into this born again. I'm okay now. Um, I'm a great person now. I'm a good person. I think he was doing that whole thing, but he seemed okay. He seemed like he was doing all right, and then maybe three, four years ago, he passed away and died from a heroin overdose. I think he might have stopped for a while and then went back to it and thought he could just take as much as he was taking when he stopped. Ugh. There was also some bad, bad stuff going around in Durango at this time. There were like a handful of kids that died, I think, this time period. And yeah, wow, I never got into heroin. I, I'm so grateful. I got into the opiates. I got into the pills, of course. And I had so many people tell me, why don't you just try H? Why don't you just try heroin? Why don't you just try this? It's cheaper. Why don't you try this? It's a lot better. Ugh, I'm just so glad I never did that. Yeah, so that was weird living with him. I kicked him out at some point. I think it was just because of all the beer cans and I thought he was on heroin. He was just kind of having trippy ass heroin people over to the house. Just kind of being, being pretty nasty and just gross at the apartment there. Just drinking and smoking and talking shit. Being fools with no plan. He was a good kid. He didn't, didn't hurt anybody, man. I mean, he didn't mean to hurt anybody. He was just kind of on the same addiction path that I was, just the tunnel vision. You don't really care about anything else, and you'll just lie and manipulate everybody to get to where you need to be. I remember several times hanging out with Jake, drinking and stuff like that, and I'm throwing on music, and I'm jumping around, headbanging, climbing on shit, and I look over, and he's just nodding off in a chair. Of course, that was more reinforcement for me and my attitude and my life of drinking. I'm like, oh, wow, well, at least I'm not where he is. At least I'm not that bad. Still, alcohol will kill you. Booze is poison, and it will fucking destroy and take everything from you. I'm hanging out in Durango. I'm doing all that thing. I think I'm staying at this apartment. All of a sudden, I kicked Jake out. I had to kick Jake out. Before him, I was living with Sam, my buddy, Sam Wason. Sam Wason. And, geez, oh, he was on some kind of hardcore probation or something. And, oh, God, I think he... He was hearing a dog bark. A dog was barking in his trailer park that he lives in. A dog was barking, wouldn't shut up. And I guess Sam took a 22 and started shooting bullets towards the dog that was barking. So I guess the next morning, the cops are there and they, Hey, brother, were you outside with a gun last night? So they find the shell casings and then they find his, they get his gun from him. They match it up. They take him, they take his ass to jail. He said he answered the door in his underwear, hair all fucked up with a blanket around him. Jeez, oh, I could just imagine it looking like Robert Downey Jr. in 95. But yeah, they took his ass to jail and they're like, dude, you shot into a home and several bullets penetrated through the home and there was a family in there sleeping. So... This mother cousin got locked up. I think he his bail was like half a mil or something crazy, close to a million or some shit, but I think it's okay to talk about this. I don't think this is going to get that big or that huge that it'll be an issue. But yeah, I think his mother put up like close to half a million dollars or some shit to bail him out. We're like, all right, Sam, you got to be good. You got to be good. But he's still drinking a beer every day. He still has to calm, calm his shakes and his nerves. So he goes and does his morning check-in. And then he drinks most of the day. But one night it got out of hand. And usually he, he was supposed to stop at like uh, 9, 9 p.m. maybe. So he could blow clean the next day when he had to go daily check in and stuff like that. Check his urine, check his breath analysis and stuff. But we were hanging out at Colin's house one night. Colin Hubertus, blackout Colin in Durango. And we're hanging out, drinking, having a fucking blast, talking shit to this fool that lived with Colin. 
geez, we were just having a blast laughing, listening to music, drinking. I think there were some mushrooms all of a sudden. I had somehow found some mushrooms. Taking little pieces. We were just taking crumbs that night, eating crumbs of mushrooms and drinking. And wow, dude, it, by like 10, 11, midnight, we were just lit up and having such a blast. We were just fucked up. It was so fun. But yeah, reality kicks in and it's like, dude, Sam's like, dude, I have to go in the morning to blow. I'm going to fail it. I'm going to go to jail. But he just like didn't give a shit. He was just, he had, he had a chance to say no or walk away or say this isn't a good idea. Just over beer, dude. Over fucking beer. I mean, yeah, he had some mushrooms too, but that I don't think would have got him in trouble as much as the alcohol did. The next day he went in and did a breathalyzer and he failed and they locked his ass up. And I didn't talk to him for a little while. Um, I think until, like, geez, oh, three or four years later. Ah, so insane. Anyways, after I had Sam living there with me, wow, I had Jake move in. Didn't know about Jake Kramer. Just knew him from, you know, middle school and elementary school and stuff. But yeah, that was just crazy. It's just like, you've got to be mindful of who you're letting into your environment. You've got to be mindful of your company and who you become friends with and who you're around all the time. You become a little bit like everybody you hang out with. You just sort of absorb some of their habits, the way they laugh, the way they talk, things they say, whatever the case. We are pretty easily influenced, and we absorb a lot of stuff. So always stand guard at the gates of your mind, and don't allow unhealthy, toxic, destructive things in. I was just getting burnt out at work. It was terrible. It was crazy. I was just messed up. And I wasn't staying up on things. I wasn't being responsible and taking care of the things I needed to take care of. Just working, getting trashed, waking up hungover and sick, and doing it all over again. Wasn't playing drums. Wasn't playing music. Didn't have a healthy outlet. Didn't have any kind of creativity going on in my life besides food and the kitchen. And it was great, but I was just overdoing it. And I was suffering from heavy burnout. And I just was bitter and didn't like the place anymore. I start focusing more on this girl. We're just, just walking around Durango, just walking around town, holding hands and talking is so amazing and awesome to me. One of those things where when you're together, nothing else matters and time doesn't exist. So I was not focusing. I was focusing more on my, my needs and pleasures and emotions right then and there in the immediate. I wasn't planning, didn't have any goals or anything. But I'm like, hey, let's move to Denver. I, I let everyone down at Steamworks. I let everyone down and I just leave. At the time, I, w I was staying with a very good friend, Ben the Hat Bettis, my man, just a brother to me. I let him down pretty hard. He was letting me stay at his on his couch. I was staying on his couch and working at Steamworks. I, I still just wanted to be with her and I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to slave away anymore. I was just slaving away at, th at this restaurant, and I, I needed something else. So I thought it'd be a cool idea to move to Denver with her, and that totally went to shit. If you listened to the last episode, if you checked out the PTSD episode, I moved to Denver, and I still had that party out outlook on life. I still had that naive immaturity, and I just thought everybody was trying to party, and everyone was kind and grateful. I thought everybody was down for life and excited to be alive. Just didn't have my third eye yet. Had not really had my heart broken yet like this. I, like my world had never been shattered like it was about to be shattered. And I moved to Denver. The theater shooting happens. I party with some really weird people. And this dude Levi is hanging out with me at the time in Aurora. We party with some weird people. I get assaulted. I get kicked in the head several times, wake up with bruises, wake up with swollen head, headache, so messed up the next day, just no energy, no focus. Oh man, it was just terrible dealing with some PTSD pretty hard, starting to get weird anxiety attacks that never happened before. Levi is just a manipulative, like, monster. He is just so fucking crazy, and he's just destroying everything he goes by. This is a guy I needed to get the fuck away from fast. And I know he had a part in that guy assaulting me. The next day, the neighbor that we were partying with said, Hey man, your, your buddy last night told that guy that you were gay before he beat you up. 
So I was like, oh shit, Levi told him that I was gay? And then he beat me up because of that weird, crazy shit. Levi's in denial forever. I haven't talked to him in like two years. I tried to look past it and gave him some second chances, gave him some third chances and things. But no, he's just not healthy. He is not healthy at all for me right now or in 2012. <laughs> I moved to Denver with my brother Tim. I work at the Cheesecake Factory. Pretty cool, good things. And yeah, that month that just really messed me up and destroyed me forever. It was so fucking insane. If you haven't checked out the TBI episode, check it out, the PTSD episode. And my girlfriend and I, basically, by the time we met back up in August of 2012, I was a different person. I was dealing with PTSD, and the person she fell in love with, the person she knew I or thought I was, was gone. We meet up and all this good stuff. We're hanging out, and we're in Denver, and things are great. I'm going to work a lot. Hey, you know, hang out with my brother, Tim. It'll be cool. They kind of fall for each other, and... Basically, one night, tell me I have to go and she can stay. I, I grabbed all my stuff and I went to somebody else's place. Brian is his name. Brian lived in the apartment complex there in Aurora. Violent, shady, dark, trippy little fucking area. It was a really weird area of Aurora. A lot of crime. Not many people to trust or turn to. So all of a sudden, I'm staying with this this neighbor guy. He's pretty cool. But it's still very hard to be that close to where I was staying and to where my brother and ex are living now. So it was really hard to be in the same complex as them. But still, it was it was just a very terrible, dark time in my life. And I didn't know what the hell to do. I didn't know how to bounce back from this. I didn't think this could ever happen. I thought it was just something that happened in movies and Eminem songs. This one night, man, I'm, a, I'm over at Cheesecake Factory and I get off at like 1 a.m. or midnight. I think I get off at midnight. My other brother, Tom, lives really close to Cheesecake Factory. So I'm like, shit, maybe I'll just go by there because it's super late. And it's just across the street from the mall in Denver where I worked at. So I take a light rail over to his place. I text him when I'm outside. And then he texts me, hey, man, Tim and your ex are here. And I was like, oh, man, damn it. So I couldn't go to his place. So I'm like, fuck, dude, it's like midnight. I got to find somewhere to stay tonight. It's about another hour and a half to my place in Aurora. My brother Tom is like, yeah, your brother Tim and your ex are over here right now. So it's probably a bad time. Cool shit. I had to figure something out fast. So I had a buddy that worked at Steam. Uh, I had a buddy that I worked at Cheesecake Factory with. And he lived in the same complex as my brother Tom, close to work. Well, I can't go to Tom's because my brother and my ex-girlfriend are there. I go over to this other guy's place, Math Matthew, I think is his name. Go to Matthew's from Cheesecake Factory. Him and his brother are trashed. They're drunk. They're fighting. They have music on really fucking loud. And I'm just like, hey guys, um, can I stay on your couch tonight? They're like, yeah, sure, bro, hell yeah, you want some shots? Fuck yeah, have some shots. I'm like, nah, man, I'm good, I gotta, I gotta figure this out, it's late, I gotta work in the morning, and I gotta kinda make sure I'm good to go in the morning, so I'm good, I'll just smoke some weed. These guys are fighting, they start arguing and fighting like brothers do, they start slamming doors and yelling at each other, and then one of them, who's just really fucked up, throws on the music even louder. It's almost 1 a.m. right now. I'm on the couch just having a good time, smoking, laughing it up. All of a sudden, dude, motherfucker, just, we just hear someone banging on the door like with a piece of metal. It sounded like somebody had a flashlight or a gun or a baton and they were beating the shit out of his door. And he just wouldn't answer the door and he kept the music on. He was just ignoring the cops. So I ran outside onto the porch. I'm like, I'm going to chill out here on the porch, do my own thing. Fuck this. Then I start seeing flashlights. Oh, and I get down on the ground. And then I look over the ledge and I see three cops with flashlights. Holy shit. This is so weird. This is terrible. And I'm like, hey, I text Tom. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Can I please come over? Can you tell them to fuck off? Because I, I need to be somewhere safe right now. Nah, man, I can't. I'm sorry. You know, they're still here. Blah, blah, blah. Holy shit. After a while, he turns off the music finally. He's just trashed. I look outside. I open the door and there are all these fucking marks and dents and shit from them. From the cops beating the fucking door in. 
And he never would, he didn't answer it. He was just all trashed. And I was sitting there just stuck in this situation. It's like when you're not on your path and you're, on, and you're not taking care of yourself, all of a sudden you're kind of on everyone else's time and you're in everyone else's world. If you're just not doing your own thing, you can just get looped into things and drama and trouble. And you'll just kind of go with the flow and find yourself around some destructive, uncomposed people. Holy shit. So, we're in Denver, all this stuff. It's like maybe five or six days after my, my brother and my girlfriend broke my heart and told me to fuck off forever. My favorite bands are in town. Stick to your guns, Suicide Silence. Obey the Brave. All these awesome bands are in town in Denver. We get tickets. And it was supposed to be this thing where my girlfriend and my brother and a bunch of us went. So, of course, we're not even talking to them. I get my buddy Brian and my other buddy Brian. Jeez, oh, two Brians I go to Denver with. We go to the show. We meet Jesse from Stick to Your Guns. We meet Alex from Obey the Brave and Despised Icon. We met all these awesome, awesome dudes. It was a fucking blast, and I needed it, man. I think I was taking some oxycodone that day, but I was also drinking. I was telling myself not to mix them this day, but I did. I was there, there were girls, there was music, my friends were there, so we were just having a blast. I started drinking, and the last band to play was Suicide Silence, and I was just up in the front row, and I was singing along with Mitch, and I was just, I had my hands up the whole night. The whole fucking time, I was just up front crying and singing along. Ugh. And I think about three, two or three months later, Mitch, the singer for Suicide Silence, died in a motorcycle accident. So that makes that night a little more special to me. But I, I remember waking up the next day just stomach in knots. I woke up at Brian's house in Aurora, where my ex and my brother were also in the building next, or a couple of buildings over. So I would just wake up feeling super sick and depressed. Just that morning depression, morning sickness, hungover, wishing I had someone to hug or hold or cuddle with or someone, someone to be with. So now I'm like thinking in my head, laying there sick. Oh my God. I'm just sitting here covered in dog hair, hungover. And my girlfriend's with somebody else and blah, 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 blah. And I had to stop thinking like that because just thinking about what she's doing, who she's with, and if she's enjoying herself, and if it's better than with me, and blah, blah, blah. You can just really fuck yourself up and beat yourself up. The best thing you can do, man, looking back, is just take the good, learn from it, try to just grow, and try to be a better person for the next relationship. That, that concert was awesome. It was so goddamn fun. I needed to see Stick to Your Guns. That was so goddamn awesome. It was just such a good, healthy outlet for me. But it did. It felt like this, the next morning just hung over in someone else's apartment, covered in dog hair, sick. It just really messed me up. It made me, it made me inspired to fight. It made me want to stand up and fight and figure out how to get a place in downtown Denver, how to get an awesome job downtown, and just focus and try to build I needed to snap out of it and start taking advantage of all the opportunity around me. But I was so fucked up. Like the head injury and then, boom, girlfriend leaves me. And I started to deal with some, I was dealing with some intense suicidal thoughts. These suicidal thoughts would just come and go. But, God, I mean, I had had them before. But this time they really stuck around and they were kind of screaming out at me. It just seemed like the only way to stop the pain. I think after a little bit there, my brother Tom ended up letting me stay over with him for a couple weeks. It was closer to my work. He has a pool, and he was just close to all my friends. So moving out of Brian's place, going over, getting out of Aurora, getting away from where they are, and going to be with my brother and closer to work was awesome. And it was just a little more exciting because Tom was, Tom was doing his thing. He was out skating and video, doing some video, videography and all this good stuff. He was just badass, and it was awesome, and he really helped me out and saved me by just letting me be around and letting me be somewhere. Of course, his roommate was super trippy and sketchy, too. Fuck. It's all good. I'm not trying to point fingers. <laughs> but yeah, we were dealing with some... We were just very immature. We didn't know how to respect each other, or... It was just hard. It was a hard time. It was a very hard time for young men growing up without 
without a father around or without a mentor, a good, strong leader around. It was just kind of us fucking up and learning from our mistakes. Yeah, well, this is episode 11. I was just trying to get get a little bit of a filler in there from that last PTSD episode. How I recovered from that whole incident. How I rebounded from that traumatic month in my life. And it was starting to get into the winter. And I, I stayed at my brother Tom's for a couple weeks. Worked really hard at Cheesecake Factory. I wasn't messing up before. When I first started at Cheesecake Factory, nothing ever got sent back to me. I was in the zone. I was focused. I was all about zero mistakes. And I kicked ass. And I loved it. And I took care of business. A couple weeks after all this shit happened, by August of 2012, I was messing things up. I was not focused. I started messing up things that I didn't ever mess up before. And the boss, one of the bosses knew it. He's like... He's like, you just can't stop thinking about her, can you? And I'm like, no, man, no, I can't. It's just, it sucks. It's terrible. So they were okay there at work, but of course they just, they wanted to make sure I was focusing and that I could handle and make sure that I'm knocking out objectives for them. That's all they really gave a shit about. They didn't really care about my situation. They just wanted to make sure I was focused and okay to work 12 hours. I got into a place downtown Denver fucking awesome. I'm, I'm on Craigslist after work all the time, trying to find a place. Boom, I find this awesome place. Second story room in Five Points in downtown Denver there. And once I moved in there, it was just a whole different world. It was amazing. It was insane. But I still didn't really have a plan. I was just in Denver now. So I was partying a lot, but I was also like, cool, if I can get to Denver, then I'll be in the city and I can focus on all the opportunity and all this good stuff that's happening around me here. There's so much energy. This is where I wanted to be. This is where I need to be. And I couldn't fucking see the silver lining. I couldn't see the positive in all of this. The biggest thing was that I was free. And I didn't have any commitments. And I was young. And I was in Denver. And I had the chance to do some amazing things for myself. I got into this really awesome mindset where I was just like slaying it in kitchens. I was just getting these awesome jobs. All of a sudden, I worked my ass off, and I had a place downtown Denver, and I was working at the Denver Arts Museum and the Denver Opera House. So awesome. It was amazing. Really got my mind off of stuff, but I was still having these weird craves and these weird anxiety issues at work. I was still kind of trying to use oxycodones and opiates whenever I could. It was just the one thing that really helped me focus and helped with the anxiety and the depression. But Jesus, so I get away from all of that crazy drama and crazy crap. I finally jump out into the city on my own. I plant my flag in downtown Five Points, Denver, and I just start focusing on the kitchen. I just start focusing on being in Denver. I think I linked up with Dickie again. I think, yeah, when I moved there into Five Points, I linked up with Dickie again. And a lot, a lot of time had passed. It was just great to see him, and I, we squashed a lot, we talked a lot, and had a, we had a hell of a time there this time around. Besides dealing with a lot of PTSD and a lot of crazy stressful kitchens, so this was it. I was in Denver, and I was just about to focus on kitchens. I was starting to move my focus and starting to make some adjustments, and I was starting to be more career-minded. I was trying to dress nicer, trying to be more clean-cut, I was just super inspired and motivated just from that buzz in Denver, just that buzz in the city and all the awesome things happening, all the opportunity. It was a very healthy move, and somehow I was able to focus on some of that. Still had weird anxiety issues happening that I didn't have before, and just a lot of depression in the mornings. Wasn't exercising, wasn't playing any music, wasn't drumming or anything. Just exploring Denver and drinking with my friends and working in kitchens. Yeah, trying to trying to push through there. It was a very hard time. And all of a sudden, it was kind of this, hey, I think I'm going to go back to Durango thing. I started getting these, these ideas and these thoughts about, I am so sad and depressed and suicidal right now. Why, I, I think I should be around my family and friends. I think I need to be in Durango. I should go back and heal. This, the city gives me anxiety. Everything's just so intense and in your face. I'm trying to love it. I'm trying to enjoy it and go with it and, and utilize what's in front of me. But I was just so fucked up. There was a lot of cognitive dissonance happening. 
because everything that I thought I believed in, everything I thought was real and true, all of a sudden wasn't. Like, everything I believed in and loved was gone. So I had to find out new ways to inspire and motivate myself. I had to find some healthy ways to heal. I think at the time, being young and in the city, the most basic, low-frequency thing that helped me was alcohol and going out with my friends drinking and being being immature and just kids, I guess, just being big kids for a little bit. But it got... After a while, you start using that as a crutch, and then it becomes a habit, and then it becomes who you are, so... I didn't know shit about psychology or behavior or anything. Didn't know much about addiction either. Didn't know much about withdrawals or side effects to medications or mixing medications. Anything. I didn't really know shit about this. But yeah, this is just kind of a little filler. This is kind of how I picked myself up after that traumatic, those traumatic events and that crazy ass life changing month of my life. This is kind of what I did afterwards and what I focused on and what I tried to do. To pick myself back up. I, I, ju- I just want to throw this out there. Like, this story takes place in 2012. To this date, in 2020, it's very important to me to be building a relationship with my family. And my mom and my brothers. And I, I love my brother Tim, and he is my best friend. Him and my brother Tom are just the most amazing people to me. So it's just super important to me that I that I make sure I'm reaching out to him and that I'm trying to rebuild and that I'm I'm not being bitter and I'm not being resentful about it and I'm not holding on to grudges as I move into the future and as I evolve as a person this here was episode 11 I just need you to go out there and have yourself a special day we're focusing on everything healthy we don't need stress right now America America this is the homesick lone wolf podcast I hope you had an amazing time. You mean a lot to me. I hope you're focusing on healthy things. I love you. This is the Homesick Lone Wolf Podcast. Play me some Pippin, man. Yay, yay!